I'm Eva Katsapi and I'm an associate professor in uh, psychology and special education at the UCL Institute of Education and a collaborator on the UCL Penn Global COVID Study. So I'll be chairing uh, today's session on behalf of Nicola Abbott, who had a few train delays and is stuck somewhere. Um, so for those of you who are just joining, welcome. Uh, this summer webinar series is sponsored by the UCL Global Engagement Fund and the goal is to share our study findings with the public and invite critique and commentaries from you, the audience, and also leading experts in industry, clinical practice, policy, and public health. So this is to ensure that our research recommendations can be applied in practice. Today, we are thrilled uh, to present some data to you at the final webinar of the series. As I said, we'll have a 25 minutes presentations from our studies team, followed by 15 minute commentaries from each of our discussants with expertise in clinical psychology, policy and nonprofit roles. Um, before wrapping up with Q&A sessions at the uh, around six o'clock. So I'm very happy to have our esteemed guests joining us today to critique and discuss our findings. A warm welcome to Deborah Slina, MBE. Uh, Deborah joined Independent Age as Chief Executive in October 2019 and brings extensive experience of voluntary sector uh, strategic leadership. Uh, she began her career in publishing and has subsequently worked in the voluntary sector for over 25 years. She has worked with a broad range of organizations from academic think tanks to charities working on international refugee and human rights issues. Prior to joining Independent Age, Deborah worked for Bowel Cancer UK for 11 years, including 10 as the chief executive. In 2017, Deborah played a leading role in merging Bowel Cancer UK and beating Bowel Cancer, becoming chief executive of the new merged charity on the 1st of January. 2018. She was awarded an MBE in the Queen's 19th Birthday Honours List 2016 in recognition of her service of bowel to bowel cancer patients and was named Charity Chief Executive of the Year at the Third Sector Excellence Award 2017 and Charity Principal of the Year in the Charity Times Awards 2018. So uh, close to my heart, my dad died of bowel cancer. Welcome, Deborah. Um, Professor David Murphy. David is a clinical psychologist who has worked in the NHS for over 30 years, mainly with patients with physical health problems and their families. He led the psychology service in an acute hospital trust in London for many years before moving into clinical psychology training as director of the University of Oxford Clinical Psychology Training Program. He is currently leading a research program on clinical leadership development based at the Center for Strategic Leadership at the University of Edinburgh and is a visiting professor in clinical psychology at UCL. David served in 2019-2020 as a president of the British Psychological Society and led its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. He also led the development of the psychological component of the NHS Your COVID Recovery Program. Welcome, David. Nigel Atter. Uh, Nigel has worked for the BPS for 20 years across a range of positions, including course accreditation, BPS qualifications, and more recently policy development, which focused on developing society policy on children and young people and education policy more generally. And of course, we have our study team member, Dr. Kerry Wong, uh, who is an assistant professor of psychology at the UCL Institute of Education and the principal investigator investigator of the UCL Penn Global COVID Study. Trained as a developmental psycholo psychologist and criminologist at the University of Pennsylvania and University of Cambridge, Kerry's research has two strands, one that focuses on understanding how children develop trust and mistrust in others and how this relates to mental health, and the second strand on the causes of crime and schizophrenia spectrum disorders. So we will hear from Kerry first. So over to you, Kerry. Thank you so much, Evie, for that introduction and welcome to all of our esteemed guests here. I feel so privileged to be sharing this platform with you um, and it's definitely because of you guys that we, uh, for this webinar at least, has been the most um, 
subscribed webinar uh, in the past uh, five out of the five webinars. So it must be you guys bringing the crowd. Um, hopefully more people will be joining us uh, later today as well. So in this final webinar of the series, um, I decided to focus on what we need to recover from the pandemic. So what kind of supports and psychological needs have people identified um, throughout our survey? Um, and what can we actually focus on? So I welcome later in the Q&A session for all of you to join in on the discussion to share your ideas and thoughts as well. Um, just to reflect a little bit um, on the five webinars that we've had in this series, uh, it's quite a mix of topics and all for every webinar, we've recorded these webinars as well. So you can now access them on our study website. Um, I hope you will, if you've missed any of them, um, go check those out as well on our study website. And then finally, um, even though this is the final webinar uh, of the series, it is not the end. Uh, we hope that this series has provided everyone with a, a platform to start conversations, if anything, um, and that uh, each of the papers presented in this series will be published um, at the UCL Open Environment Journal, which is a new open access journal uh, later this year. So look out for that and stay tuned uh, and, and um, hope you are receiving our study uh, updates as well. Um, I also want to thank all the other um, study members of the team um, without which this uh, study wouldn't be possible. Um, and so here they are all uh, collectively on, on this, this slide. You can see it's a real team effort really to um, conduct a study of this magnitude. So I'll be presenting today some data from the UCL Penn Global COVID study. I know about half of you on the call have participated in the study, so you, the survey questions won't be new to you. But for those of you who haven't taken part, thanks for joining and uh, here I will give you a brief overview of the study um, as well. So our study uh, is an online study uh, survey that went out last April, um, just as um, the UK lockdown um, uh, restrictions um, actually happened. Um, so between uh, April and July last year, we conducted our first survey. So we've identified this as wave one here. And about uh, over 2000 people took part um, at varying levels of the survey. Um, and so some of that data you've already um, heard about in our previous webinars. You can also see that from wave one, there has been a real mixture or a wide range of participants from all over the, the globe, but primarily from the UK, Greece, Italy, and the US. In wave two, uh, which happened to coincide, we didn't plan this, but happened to coincide with the second UK national lockdown. Um, so that survey took place between October and January um, of this year. Um, and then the final um, survey that we um, started and, and conducted in April this year is actually still ongoing. And we're aiming to close that survey at the end of uh, the month. Um, but today I will be focusing specifically on the data that we collected from wave three, given that we included questions here um, that was of more qualitative nature and we asked people what kind of support they needed. So today I'll be presenting on uh, data from about 900 um, respondents who had also responded from waves one and two as well. Okay, so the main question and data I'll be presenting on um, is from this question, what do you need to recover from the pandemic? Um, and so the two kind of, I'm gonna split this section into kind of two parts. The first part will focus on, just to contextualize what people have been saying, um, this first part will focus on uh, the types of stressors that people have identified um, during the pandemic. Um, but then also across the 12 month period of which we have data for, um, how, has these, how have these stressors changed over time? Which of those have worsened, improved, or even in some cases remained the same? And then I'll move on to give you a bit more of an in-depth um, set of uh, slides looking at exactly what people have said in terms of what support they would want um, for the next six months in order to thrive and recover from the pandemic. So the bulk of the presentation will focus on this second point here. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, send out a poll 
uh, here, I'd like you to guess before I present the results to you, what you think um, are the kind of key stressors that people have identified. Very good. So it seems like mental health, uh, you guys, uh, many people on the call have identified mental health. Um, about 76% of you have said mental health um, potentially have worsened um, since April 2020. Uh, close uh, second is boredom and loneliness, followed by, let's say, future plans. Um, let me, oh, I realized I didn't share the results, so here you can't see them. But um, boredom and loneliness is the, is the third. Um, and uncertainty surrounding COVID still is something that all the concern and a stressor. So, okay, let's have a look at the results. So it turns out, as we had asked this question across the three time points at which we had launched the survey, it turns out that the top kind of stressors that people um, have seen worsening effects for since April 2020 are mental health, physical health, work-related stress, as well as marriage and or romantic relationships. So the uh, these four seem to be um, worse off than, uh, than April 2020 uh, in a year ago. Interestingly, some things have improved and that's good. So less concerning or stressful things um, included, include the uncertainty surrounding COVID, other people not wearing face masks and government COVID guidelines seem to be perhaps be clearer. At least we're seeing reductions, but still, you know, a, a substantial amount of, um, you know, people who have said that this was a key stressor. And then the other things that have, uh, there are other factors that um, people have identified as being unchanged include future plans, boredom and loneliness, and other people not social distancing. So just the fact that it's remained the same across the th our three time points doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a real concern. As you can see, quite a substantial uh, proportion of our respondents also say that actually these are um, stressors. It's just that it seems to be the same proportion um, across this, the time uh, the time period. Okay, so our second part, a second question I asked was, what support would you and your family need in the next six months in order to thrive and recover from the pandemic? Again, before I show you the results, I'd like you to uh, attempt this question. So again, as a multiple choice question, so you should see all the options here now in front of you. Um, so select all that applies. Which of these things um, do you think people have identified? It looks like uh, most people have identified and said uh, vaccines, freedom to travel and to see people. That is probably a priority and thing that uh, people have identified as a key source of support. Um, other, the second one is access and continued access to, uh, that should say mental health, by the way. <laughs> uh, I can see a typo. And then um, close, Third is financial support and job help, followed by understanding from others and personal um, support as well. Okay, then let's see if you your results match up. So it turns out when we analyze all of our responses, about 880 of the 89 of them who have answered uh, and completed this question, we learned that 36% of the sample actually feel okay. They think they've, um, you know, uh, been, been coping with the pandemic all right. Um, they don't need further support or at least support that they can see being um, realized or feasible. Um, however, the remaining sample um, did identify kind of five key areas and themes that they would need, they think they need support in. Um, and rightly so, as you guys uh, on this call have, have guessed, vaccines, freedom to travel and seeing other people, that was a key uh, theme that came out, followed by insurances from employers and financial support and help, uh, access and continued access to mental health services, as well as clarity in government guidelines and messaging, followed by finally understanding from others and personal support as well. So what, let's have a look at each of these themes in a bit more detail. For theme one, vaccines, travel, and seeing people, 
uh, here's what our respondents told us. Um, they'd like to see numbers to go down so that their kids can go back to school. For example, they're even open to having uh, children having vaccines as well. Many, um, suppose, I guess, parents have spoken about young children, even in primary school, um, getting and being offered uh, vaccines as well, so they can feel more confident that their children, as well as their teachers, um, are fully vaccinated and safe. Many people spoke about um, being able to freely go uh, on holidays, on vacation, to finally see their families abroad um, and to have that emotional support and contact as well. Um, not needing to socially distance or physically distance from each other, um, especially from family and close one, uh, ones, that's a key theme um, and some of the comments that we saw. Um, there was talk about requiring proof of vaccination for um, students as well as for adults in the um, return uh, to workplaces as well, which we'll see in a later slide. Um, and then just generally making sure that a large portion of the world population can be vaccinated and is so that global travel is actually possible uh, again, especially um, for uh, those, especially students as well, who've talked about um, needing or wanting to see their families because they haven't done so for over um, 18, 20 months. The second theme of assurances from employers and financial support and help. Many people, uh, of our, many of our respondents spoke about having and um, or being allowed to continue flexible work routines and working from home schedules. Um, and many people even spoke about having worked so much or overworked that it seems like in this instance, uh, this quote here, feels like they've been working nonstop since March, 2020. Um, maybe many of us on the call can also appreciate that as it, uh, and as this resonates with perhaps many of our lives as well. Um, there's a lot of a lot of comments also spoke about financial security, many of them um, asking for the government support or extra support, including also support in finding and seeking jobs. Um, comments alluded to um, participants uh, having lost their jobs and not knowing what else to do, or even their family members having lost their jobs and then wanting support in that sense as well. Um, so here you can see that these quotes uh, speak to that as well. And then finally also um, whether or not things will be okay um, at work when they return to work, is it going to be safe? Um, or whether or not flexible working can um, remain, um, which many of us this past year has experienced and perhaps actually enjoyed and found positive uh, things out of this um, situation. And then there's the third theme, um, most common theme, which is access and also continued access to mental health services. Here uh, is quite interesting as um, access and also continued access to mental health crosses across stakeholders, I would say. So we heard from our participants that many of them themselves wanted access to mental health or at least continued access to therapy or counseling that they maybe pre prior to pan the pandemic, they didn't need it or or in some cases they had it. And during the pandemic, they, it was very difficult for them to continue having that access. Um, and as you can see here in the quotes as well, many participants spoke about their other family members needing access to and support um, uh, for mental health. Um, and in some cases, even couples therapy and um, family therapy for um, couples and relationships, as well as in some cases, their parents' uh, relationships as well, um, as they have observed um, having lived perhaps in the same household with their parents as well. Um, here, there's uh, this comment down here is quite interesting. Um, the, I guess the parent says, we are applying for early help already. We have an appointment with CAMS, uh, which is the UK Mental Health, uh, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. Um, but the time and space to continue doing these things perhaps haven't been um, obvious. And they hope that they won't have to do a lot more catch up work and lessons from schools um, when they return to school uh, and uh, in the new year. 
So it seems that perhaps also our participants are talking about um, ways in which the government, perhaps in some instances, as well as scientists, um, may be able to encourage um, the public and to offer um, more scientific evidence to make people feel safer in the return to whatever the normalcy might be. Uh, and then the fourth theme talks about the clarity in government guidelines and messaging. So here there has really been a mixed bag. Um, some of it and most of it actually has focused on the inconsistency of government um, guide guidelines, primarily uh, in this case in the UK, most of the responses were coming from the UK. So better evidence-based guidelines from, guidance from our government, more information on the transmission of COVID, um, and many also saying that they're currently not able to trust certain media sources um, as a result of the uh, presentation and handling of the COVID situation. Um, they also believe that uh, it is the government's uh, duty and responsibility to be offering um, clear guidelines and official messaging around how people can be safe whilst being outside. Um, and uh, it's so important that they are clear and understandable to the public. Uh, many people wrote uh, that um, the guidelines are very unclear and often shows that it's lacking. It's almost like the government is um, offloading their responsibility and duties to um, corporations as well as to individuals themselves. And people uh, prefer that the governments were actually um, offering more clear guidance. Um, including, this is, pro, uh, as you can see here, um, uh, comments that was pre-July uh, uh, 19th, as that was the latest kind of easing of lockdown in the UK. Um, but it is uh, interesting to see what people were worried about um, in terms of the um, complete opening and relaxing of COVID restrictions um, off, uh, you know, as a mandate by the, by the government as well. And then finally, uh, the final theme, which is understanding from others and personal support. Um, there were lots of comments, just general ones about um, needing help and support around the house. Many people felt that they've been stuck at their, in their homes for the entire year and they don't have enough time to even um, take care of the home and to them, um, for themselves as well. There is a clear kind of set of comments looking at um, bereavement and loss as well. So being able to grieve um, the loved ones who have passed, that was a comment that came through in, in this theme as well. Many people spoke about getting proper vaccination. They're uh, having kind of facts and trusted information out there so that um, many more people can get vaccinated as well. Um, that will help themselves and their own well being uh, so they feel safe to re enter society. And as you can see here, um, babysitting, childcare uh, support was also something, a clear comment that came through in this uh, theme as well. So with that said, all, now that we've covered and have a more detailed account of what each of these themes are, what should we focus on, at least based on what our data has shown? Here, I've picked out the kind of three key areas that I think um, our data supports. Um, and so the first one really is a focus on relationships, um, support and easing people back into social life, maybe particularly important for young children, especially when they're re-entering uh, schools um, and also um, helping them feel safe enough to return to schools. So in the UK, we have the independent SAGE group who is currently and has been for the past 20 months calling for the government to have um, increasingly more ventilation in schools. Uh, that would, could help um, prevent the spread of COVID and potentially um, make schools a safer place for young learners. It's also important, uh, given our uh, previous webinars in this series as well, to address self-perceived feelings of loneliness and ensure that people are not fearful or anxious to go back to work in closed environments and that the, the guidelines from employers are clear enough so that we can, again, start rebuilding these trusting relationships with our colleagues and with other people outside of our social bubbles. 
And then mental health and, ac and access to mental health should be a priority. As we can, as we saw in these uh, in the past previous slides, um, there is a real need uh, to, for mental health access. And if anything, the COVID uh, pandemic has kind of shone a light on mental health being a key area uh, that has often, you know, often been a, an, er, an area that should have been focused on even pre-pandemic, but especially now that we really need to devote resources to these, um, to the support as well. So maybe many of you, if you're an employer um, or actually, you know, just anyone generally, um, a focus on ensuring that your employees are mentally healthy, um, that can help with their physical health as well as their work as well. Um, and that this can have real uh, benefits to your you know, company as well as our com community as well. So again, this emphasis on um, safe return to work as well as clear government guidelines uh, to ensure that mental health is a priority uh, should be taken into consideration. And then finally, a final point that I think we should focus on is bereavement and coping with loss. Um, many people in our society now, as a result of the COVID pandemic, has experienced loss in some way, shape, or form. Um, so it's so important that we are uh, we have empathy towards that, and you know, often these uh, for. For many people, often this is not an obvious observable thing that you can just see, just as mental health um, and so forth. So for example, from our study, and these are the last couple of slides, when we ask people, do you know of friends or family members who have tested positive for COVID? Um, we can see across the three waves and time points, this number has increased you know, dramatically. Um, and so, when we broke this down further to ask people, do you know anyone who has passed away? You can see from wave two, so this is the second time point, very few people actually, 70% said this doesn't apply. So they don't really know anyone who has passed away because of COVID. But by this most recent wave, you can see that actually now, the 30, 70, 77% pretty much um, are or know people who have passed away and they are either their acquaintances, uh, friends, or even close, uh, close family loved ones. So with that said, um, these are kind of the key themes that have come through when we've asked people about support. Um, I will now pass the uh, platform on to, uh, to Deborah, who will tell us a bit more about kind of critiquing our studies a little bit, but also to provide us with kind of the um, solutions as well as some of the things that other organizations, especially independent age, have been um, um, conducting and doing as well. Uh, over to you, Deborah. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Kerry. And, you know, just really interesting kind of results that you shared there um, that, you know, very much resonate with me, both in terms of the work that we do at Independent Age, but also as an employer as well, and the work that, that we're doing to support our staff um, and our volunteers to, to safely return to the, the roles that they enjoy. So, so firstly, just say thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Um, it's great to be here. Um, and as you mentioned, I'm, I'm Chief Executive of um, a, a UK national charity called Independent Age, um, and we work with, alongside older people. So, and that's people over the age of 65. And our mission at Independent Age is to ensure that as we all grow older, we all have the opportunity to live well with dignity, choice and purpose. And we do three core things to deliver that mission. So firstly, we deliver information, advice and connection services for older people. We share best practice, facilitate and fund capacity building in our sector. And finally, we campaign for positive change on the issues that older people tell us matter most in the areas of health and care, poverty and loneliness. So I was really delighted when Kerry approached me to be part of this webinar and to find out more about the global study as we have been conducting qualitative and uh, quantitative research ourselves throughout the pandemic. Um, and whilst not in any way as academically robust as the uh, UCL Penn Global Study, it's been incredibly helpful to ensure we have understood older people's experiences and could then feed that into every aspect of our work. 
So I thought um, it might be a useful contribution to this debate to share some of our top line findings as a comparison. So about some of those stresses, as Kerry described them, from the, the global study research and also to share some of our thoughts on what we believe needs to happen as part of the post pandemic recovery here in the UK. That, that I hope also might have some relevance to other countries too, as I'm obviously aware that it's, a, it's an international audience. So since the pandemic began, we've conducted four surveys, um, the most recent in June this year, so a, a, a very similar flow to the global study. And across these, we have heard from thousands of older people, people over 65, and learned how the situation for them was changing. Um, and as Kerry was highlighting, about their, their concerns at each stage. And I just want to pick up on, on, on five of those particular themes. So my first theme is around financial security. So here in the UK, there are now in fact 2.1 million people over 65 living in poverty. Um, and this number is rising. It's risen in fact by about 5% since 2011. And concerns about money and financial security have been a really consistent theme that we've been hearing about throughout the pandemic. In the autumn, out of 5,000 respondents to our Home Truth survey, and I can put some links to these in the chat afterwards for those who are interested, almost one in four people, <clears throat> excuse me, said they were feeling more financially secure because of the pandemic. The most common responses from people who said they were facing extra costs for day-to-day -day living, those who had lost income, and people who were worried about the potential impact of a recession and the state of the economy in general. One million over 65s were instructed to shield at the start of the pandemic and all over 70s were told that they were clinically vulnerable. So people found themselves spending more shopping, more time shopping online or shopping locally at greater cost to avoid public transport. Maureen told us the cost of living has increased. Most times I have to take items off my grocery list because I can't afford them. The pandemic in general and lockdown measures in particular have meant people have been spending more time at home. There has been a corresponding increase in energy use and people in later life told us that they spent more on energy bills, even during the spring and summer when costs are normally lower. And this is obviously extremely concerning as many older people are already vulnerable to fuel poverty. People also shared their worries about the state of the economy and its impact on their savings and pensions. They were worried what a recession would mean for their own often small private pension savings or investments, the benefits they receive or the ability of the state pension to keep up with rising costs of living. Some have already lost money because of the falling value of investment and savings. Jackie told us, we've managed and helped our family out, but we worry about the future years as obviously the small amount of pension we have will now not last as long or go so far. Uh, we believe it's absolutely vital that older people living in poverty here in the UK are able to access a state benefit called pension credit uh, and associated winter fuel payments, yet currently 1 million people are missing out. Many also will require financial advice and support from maximising savings to understanding what benefits they could be entitled to, to ensure they own the most efficient and cost effective fuel tariffs, for example, all important aspects of helping people feel more financially secure. The second theme I just want to highlight is, uh, like Kerry's, is around bereavement. So um, money worries can become more pronounced when someone experiences a bereavement. So, uh, uh, you know, tragically, as we all know, death has been such a major part of COVID-19, hasn't it? With people of all ages experiencing unexpected grief. However, the deaths that have occurred during the pandemic have probably disproportionately impacted people in later life. And at independent age, we estimate that more than 300,000 people over the age of 65 have been bereaved of a partner within the first year of the pandemic up until March 2021 due to COVID and other factors. And of course, the death of a partner is a significant life event at any time and the one that will have a huge impact on the majority of people in this situation. 
However, we believe that a significant number of people who have been bereaved during COVID could be at risk of experiencing something called complicated or prolonged grief. And complicated or prolonged grief can happen when someone loses multiple people they care about close together, or when they can't be with someone at the end of their life or have no warning about their death, and when they're unable to seek comfort from their support networks, or when those rituals of death, dying and bereavement haven't been in place, such as funerals. And sadly, of course, all of these factors have been commonplace during the pandemic. Pro professional bereavement support is often needed to support someone through complicated grief. However, here in the UK, that support is not readily available and research we've undertaken has shown that bereavement services are not consistently commissioned. We believe it's vital that the government and the health service take responsibility for this important issue and invest in the support services which people tell us that they need, whether that's counselling, group therapy or mental health support. And, and this is a priority area for us uh, at Independent Age, and we've been part of a group of charities who have set up an independent UK bereavement commission, which will be hearing evidence and producing recommendations on the improvements that need to be made to bereavement services in the UK. And I think this is going to be really vital for people of all ages during the pandemic recovery phase. Um, a, a third theme for me linked, I guess, to Kerry's uh, relationship themes around loneliness and isolation. So bereavement, of course, can also exacerbate feelings of loneliness and isolation. Pre-pandemic, it was estimated that 1.2 million people over 65 were chronically lonely. And during the early stages of the pandemic, we co-chaired a government task force and undertook some further research, including a survey to understand the impact uh, during the pandemic. And just under 600 individuals and 95 organisations responded. 74% of respondents said they lacked companionship and felt left out often or some of the time. 82% said they felt isolated from others some of the time or often. Almost three in four, 74% said they felt lonely at the time of the survey and 9% said they always felt lonely. And when asked how the pandemic had affected them, 72% of respondents said their contact with organisations that used to interact with before the pandemic had decreased. 73% said that the coronavirus pandemic had made them feel significantly or somewhat more lonely or isolated than they did before. And around one in four said they felt the same levels of loneliness as before the pandemic. So I guess quite similar to some of the results that Kerry was highlighting. And the task group concluded that whilst loneliness, loneliness was new for many during the pandemic, including for many younger people, for older people, as we know, many were experiencing high levels of loneliness and isolation pre-pandemic, and for many that has been made worse. It's clear that the ending of lockdown alone will not fix that for people. Many will need support, including services such as our own independent age, reconnections and community services to break the chains of loneliness and isolation and to reconnect to the people, places and activities that will bring them joy and purpose. My fourth theme is around mental health. Um, and, uh, it's been such a, a huge theme, just as Kerry highlighted too. So of course it's linked to my first three themes um, and it's really stood out for us. In fact, 66% of the 5,000 respondents to our late 2020 survey told us that they felt worried or anxious about the impact COVID-19 could have on their life. In addition, almost half, 42% of our survey respondents reported that their mental health had become worse or much worse since the start of the pandemic. And our um, independent age helpline advisors have backed this up and told us that calls have got a lot harder with some people incredibly anxious, upset and lonely. And of course, talking therapy can be a big help to people. Yet we know from our Minds That Matter research, which was published in October 2020, um, that not enough people in later life are told about or offered treatment to improve their mental health. For example, pre-pandemic, people aged 65 only made up 6% of referrals to the NHS England Talking Therapy Programme, but make up 18% of our population. But during the pandemic, this actually dropped to 5%. We strongly believe that as part of the recovery, it is absolutely vital that more people in later life have access to this important support. And that's what they've told us that they want. The final area I wanted to highlight is around physical health, which I think is perhaps slightly 
underplayed in, in Kerry's uh, kind of priorities from an older people's perspective. So we know that physical health problems can affect every aspect of somebody's life. People told us that COVID-19 has significantly infect, affected their physical health, whether or not they contracted the virus. And much of this is because the pandemic has disrupted people's ability to speak to their doctor or access treatment. And with one million people in later life told to shield and many more feeling too worried to leave their homes, many older people's mobility has been severely affected, with some telling us they've gone from being able to go for walks to being housebound and unable to easily get off their sofa. In fact, um, in our as yet unpublished survey from June, 53% of our 3,103 respondents said that their physical health had got worse with 20% waiting longer than they should do for surgery. One survey respondent shared, my mobility has got worse as my knee replacement operation was postponed and my shoulder problems have become more painful. My GP was unhelpful about this and my decreasing mobility, especially going up and down stairs, uh, really worries me as I live alone. We found out that nearly 50% of our survey respondents had had some type of problem with their treatment, from access to their medication to being able to book GP or specialist appointments. 16% told us that their regular health care or treatment had been postponed or cancelled because of the pandemic. This is obviously really concerning, as diagnosis and treatment for serious issues will affect people's ability to recover from them. Barbara told us, I can't see consultants. I received a severe lack of communication and the overwhelming impression is I don't matter because I'm old. As concerns around health came out as one of the key issues for older people over the last year, as it always does, we're doing a new piece of research currently looking at people's access to surgery and the impact of being on the now very long surgical waiting lists. In fact, here in the UK, surgical waiting lists now stand at over 4.5 million people. And with our already underfunded health service and exhausted health professionals, people are likely to be waiting for a while. This will, of course, have a huge impact on the health and quality of life of many people, including those in later life. We believe that there are both big and small changes which can be made, which would significantly improve people's experience of waiting and help to ensure they do not can decondition further. For example, communicating effectively with people while they're on the waiting list and offering information on exercises and activities they could take part in to stay as healthy as possible before their operation. And, and we should be able to release this new work in the late autumn. So in conclusion, our research and regular contacts with older people highlights that financial security, bereavement, loneliness, mental and physical health are key issues of concern. They always are, but they've got a lot worse through the pandemic. And, and it's very similar, I guess, to the findings of the global study, but, but as I said, perhaps with a greater focus on physical health, which didn't come out as clearly from the all ages data. And we believe that it's essential that older people's concerns are considered as part of the recovery, not because they're more important than younger people, but because they are as important. This is not the time to stoke the flames of intergenerational tension, which we have seen too often through the pandemic, rather to build a recovery plan for us all. And whilst so many of the issues highlighted impact people of all ages, for older people, their combination can make them more difficult to overcome and detract from their ability to enjoy a happy, connected and purposeful later life, which is, after all, what we all aspire to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. That's fantastic. I believe uh, Nigel is going to be um, taking the floor uh, now. So over to you, Nigel. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Kerry, for the invite to uh, speak today. Um, good afternoon, uh, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nigel Atter. I'm a policy advisor for the British Psychological Society and I've worked for the society for over 20 years now. We're a professional body, um, learned society. Um, we support our members that are engaged in research practice and education and training 
Um, most recently, I've contributed to the society's policy campaigns on children and young people's mental health, and also our From Poverty to Flourishing campaign, and contributed to the society's policy development um, on COVID, specifically uh, in relation to isolation and confinement. But by way of introduction, I want to talk a little bit about pre pre pandemic. Um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, there was significant progress had been made in improving the lives, health and well-being of people across the globe. Life expectancy was increasing and mortality rates amongst children and mothers was improving. However, depression and anxiety remain one of the most common mental health conditions with up to three to four percent of the world's population living with these afflictions at any given time. Together, they are responsible globally for 8% of years lived with a disability. Mental health conditions can emerge as a result of experience of a range of psychosocial challenges, such as poverty or adverse childhood experiences, which can increase the likelihood of experiencing anxiety and depression, interpersonal and domestic violence or drug and alcohol abuse, amongst other challenges. We know that prevention and early intervention are crucial to address premature mortality from non-communicable diseases and to promote mental health and well-being. Countries with the fewest mental health providers often have the most stressors, including violence, poverty, forced migration, social unrest, political instability. Between 75 and 85 percent of people with severe mental health conditions are unable to access treatment and they need for their mental health, sorry, their treatment for their mental health condition in low to middle income countries compared to 50, uh, sorry, 35 to 50 percent of people in high income countries. In the United Kingdom, a recent system, systemic review, sorry, systematic review found that improving access to psychological therapies enabled large scale access to effective evidence based psychological therapy for large numbers of patients. The improving access to psychological therapies program has transformed services for people with low to moderate anxiety and depression and potentially this could serve as a model for treatment in other countries. However, we need to be aware of cultural sensitivity. Psychologists and other mental, uh, sorry, psychologists and other health professionals have highlighted the importance of culturally appropriate approaches to psychosocial interventions. Accessibility to culturally appropriate therapeutic provision is important, made more likely through culturally sensitive care pathways and services. In the United Kingdom, many national health service trusts are working to provide inclusive culturally sensitive mental health services. Globally, service providers must develop accessible, culturally sensitive and translation advice and, in, and information. To optimize the impact, psychologists should engage with community organizations to ensure that support is provided in an appropriate, accessible and culturally sensitive way. Psychologists play their part by ensuring that psychological assessments, formulations and interventions are written in accessible language, which is culturally sensitive and non-discriminatory. In terms of scaling up, there are many examples of good practice and psychologically informed interventions to alleviate poor mental health. The challenge really is in scaling them up and ensuring that they are accessible to communities. In 2013, the World Health Organization launched its uh, first global mental health action plan with a particular focus on how psychologists can train lay workers to deliver sophisticated psychological interventions to improve mental health, expanding the reach of psychology. And it is crucial that broad-based mental health policies encompass the Im impact of broader social contexts, such as poverty, racism, poor housing, violence, and other stressors on individuals, families, and their communities. All countries, whatever their wealth and income, can help find ways to address these issues. Um, action needs to be taken urgently to improve mental health and well-being through prevention and treatment. I'm just going to touch on uh, some of Kerry's findings that she, she's uh, um, led on uh, this afternoon. 
24% of respondents wanted a reduction in workload, and this certainly will improve well-being for many. Indeed, the research supports this. 23% of respondents wanted continued access to mental health services. The pandemic has had a significant impact on mental health across the entire population. And for example, National Health Service Digital Services have reported that mental health difficulties for children in, and young people have increased from one in nine to one in six children. And there's also a corresponding sharp increase in eating disorders, particularly amongst young, young women and girls, which is particularly worrying. Of the 14% that wanted a greater understanding from others and personal support, there have been some excellent examples of communities pulling together to support those most in need. Assurances from employers and financial support and help are, have been highlighted by 12% of respondents. It is very concerning here in the United Kingdom that the £20 per week uplift of universal credit is to be discontinued in September. Furthermore, disabled people have seen their benefits cut disproportionately. Additionally, um, research by the BBC has found that um, people with disabilities have been forgotten during the pandemic. They spoke to thousands of people about their experiences during the crisis, with most saying that their disability had got worse, and with over two and a half thousand reporting that routine, often vital medical appointments had been cancelled. A key worry was the reduction to access to care and support, with you know, two and a half thousand saying that their mental health had got worse and many signposted um, their instruction to shield at home as causing greater isolation and contributing to worse care. Scope, which is one of the United Kingdom's largest dis disability charities, commented to say that the BBC's findings confirmed the government's failure to provide support for disabled people throughout the pandemic. 11% of respondents to the survey wanted greater clarity for government guidelines and messaging. And indeed, the independent scientific advisory group of which many eminent British psychologists sit on have been advocating for exactly this. So what do we need to recover? The society has, done, has been lobbying government to address a number of issues um, on multi-generational and ingrained poverty, for example, on education attainment. Just on that, Kevin Collins, the former UK government's advisor on educational recovery, talked about uh, uh, on international comparisons that the UK's package of recovery is feeble in compared to what's going on in elsewhere, and that the shock, the scale of the shock that the British children have had it requires a massive national effort for recovery, not just a bit of tutoring, and it's going to take time. And he was advocating that recovery should be the outcome of everything we do instead of having a narrow focus. He went on to resign his position because um, the government refused to put forward a, a significant amount of funding to support educational recovery. The Education Policy Institute, in terms of funding wider wellbeing and mental health support in the UK, identified that there's a gap in mental health support for children and young people. And again, this compares poorly internationally. The Education Policy Institute estimated that a total funding in the UK is just £310 per pupil compared to £1,800 in the United States of America and £2,100 per pupil in the Netherlands. In both of these countries, there is greater focus on well-being and vulnerable groups. We as a society have lobbied the government to address systemic racism, inequality, hunger and food insecurity, insecure employment, children and young people's mental health, neighbourhood violence and the lack of opportunity. So what should the UK government do to address these? We believe that it should be developing a comprehensive cross departmental anti-poverty strategy, that it should be ensuring that collaborative multi-agency working is the default approach for all levels of national, regional and, regional and local government. Um, we believe that they should be promoting and facilitating multi-agency working to integrate health, education and social care services. That doesn't certainly happen enough at the moment. These initiatives point towards promise of population impact 
through psychological interventions that are delivered in a collaborative system of care. We also believe that services should be co-produced with people from the local community who use them. It is essential to draw on individual and community expertise. This will empower them to support local communities to transform economically um, disadvantaged areas. I don't think you know, we can think about recovery in a time frame of just six months, but in terms of years, um, the Center for Mental Health has predicted that you know, there is an additional 10 million people needing mental health support. And the, 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 the services to undertake that volume of people just simply aren't there. And so it's really just watch this space, keep lobbying, lobbying, keep pressing you know, for government you know, to do more and to support people in need. So thank you very much indeed for your opportunity. Thank you, Nigel. That was brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. And now we are going to move into David. So, David, the floor is yours. Thanks, Evie. Um, well, thank you first, uh, Kerry and Evie, for the invite to um, take part in this um, discussion. Um, I think, uh, Kerry, you, you mentioned earlier that our presence is perhaps the fact, the reason why this is the most subscribed one. I think you, you overlooked the fact that the other four might have generated in, in interest, so I, I think we should put it down to that. Um, I, I, Nigel and Deborah have given such um, comprehensive um, follow-ups to Kerry's um, great presentation that I'll keep my comments quite brief so that we can um, I'm sure the audience will want to come in with some questions. Um, what I'll perhaps try and do is just to, to sort of highlight some meta themes that, that sort of perhaps cut across um, all three of the previous um, speakers' comments. Um, just to, to reiterate briefly, um, I'm, as um, Evie said in the introduction, a clinical psychologist by background, um, mainly worked in physical health, um, mainly in London, in fact. Um, and I just happened to be the president of the British Psychological Society last year at the start of the pandemic, um, which was a, a kind of a coincidence, really. So um, I uh, ended up leading our BPS work and particularly being involved with um, the NHS uh, in England and the other um, nations, uh, particularly involved in staff well-being in the NHS. And also, as Evie said, I was uh, involved in the development of the um, post-COVID, NHS post-COVID rehab program. Um, as I think back over the COVID pandemic, I think, you know, it's hard not to think of all the desperately sad aspects of it. And it's a bit like a, a, a sort of pond and a, and a stone, the, the COVID virus dropping in and then these rings moving out from the, from the middle. And, you know, the first thing you think about is the number of people who've died in, in the UK. It's 129,000 and rising, of course, still rising, uh, people who've died. We've already mentioned the people who are bereaved um, uh, the, the, and left behind uh, from those people who died. And um, as has been said, they're often predominantly older people. Um, but there's also lots of people left with long-term symptoms. We estimate up to a million people in the UK uh, alone with long COVID. Um, I've worked a lot with NHS staff and um, NHS staff have been through uh, a really stressful time, as, as people in many other sectors have been. Um, there have been people whose education, particularly younger people who ed whose education milestones in terms of social um, development have been disrupted. There are people whose livelihoods have been lost and, and their businesses um, severely affected. Um, other people whose general well, health and, and fitness has been affected. People have um, experienced the, um, suffered the rise in domestic violence. Um, there've been people obviously who've been struggling to work at home, adapt to the working at home and also adapting to homeschooling as well. Um, and then we've also mentioned earlier people who've experienced isolation and loneliness. So, you know, I think we can see the pandemic as, you know, in one sense, it's a tiny virus that we have to look under a microscope to see, but these, these effects uh, are really very far ranging. I think there's also some positives, and um, I think um, the UCL Penn study actually illustrates that. I mean, I think uh, I'm in awe of how 
uh, quickly um, you managed to get the study off the ground. 17th of April is really impressive. Um, and, the, and the international collaboration. And I think that's been one really positive thing that's come out of uh, the pandemic has been that we've reached out, you know, collaborating between silos uh, within the BPS. We, we collab, you know, it was one of the real positives was collaborating with different uh, sort of psychologists collaborating together. And also I, I ended up doing more international work, I think, than any of my predecessors as president. We actually met as presidents of international psychological societies on a weekly basis um, for about the first six months during the pandemic. Um, and that's a real source of strength. Um, in terms of the study, I mean, I, I, it, it's a really impressive, I think, to, to get the study uh, out and to get a, a reasonably large and, and international sample. I think obviously we have, uh, as, a, as a sort of uh, researcher, I have to mention the caveats to the study that we have to bear in mind when we think about the results. Obviously, any kind of study like this where you're having people opting in um, as opposed to taking a sort of epidemiological approach, has a selection bias and, and it's clear you from from the information that you've presented that there is um this, this sample is is um uh, more highly educated at higher income than than the populations in the, in the country studied um and also in a longitudinal study over three points of time you you've got some people who participate just at one point so we have to be careful to you know, the differences may be in relation to differences in the sample rather than actual changes over time. Um, and then I think w one thing as we as you come into asking uh, people what what they think, what they think their needs are, I think it, that can be quite difficult. I mean, people are, it's reasonable to ask people what what their sort of experiences are. Um, asking what what their um, what would help them, I think, then requires knowledge of evidence base for different interventions, which which is obviously lacking. So I think you do have to be cautious when people say this is what I think I need. And I, I illustrated that this morning. I mentioned before we started the um, webinar that I've got an ear infection at the moment, and I saw my GP this morning, and I said I walked in there and said I need antibiotics, <laughs> as many people do in that situation. She said no, no, you what you need is decongestion. And I was like, no, that's not right. Um, I was very, I mean, a lot of validity in my perception, my symptoms, um, but but when it comes to needs, it, that's that you know we, we have to bear that in mind. Um, but anyway, so just those caveats. Just in terms of briefly the the themes that come that come through, um, I think one of the things that was um, people said a lot at the beginning of the pandemic is that we're all in this together. It was kind of a rallying call um, at, at the beginning of the pandemic. We're all in the same boat. And I think what's clear from, from the comments of all, all three of the speakers is that um, we, ha we have been through the same storm. I think you know, we've all been affected in one way or other, but you know, we, we've been through the same storm, but we're in different boats. And I think it's really clear that some people's experience of the pandemic has been very different to others. Um, and so I think what's been really highlighted is, is the importance of seeing things from the individual's perspective and understanding the context within which they're they're operating with um you know there are some people like my my my, my brother lives um, down on the south coast and he works in the city of london and has a two-hour commute every day and so what it, the, in some ways the pandemic has been a real blessing to him and he's had more time to spend with his family um, you know, other people who, you know, live, live in high rise flats and had to isolate with and homeschooling children, their experience is really different. So I think it's really important to, to take individual perspective into account. Uh, Nigel mentioned actually, well, but, um, uh, 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 Nigel and Deborah both mentioned uh, specific um, people with disabilities uh, and their needs. And it's it, people with disabilities have often commented to me that things that they've been asking for in terms of remote working, uh, uh, they've, been, they've been told were impossible. Uh, suddenly it's been possible and, and not just possible, but mandated. Um, but, you know, we, we know that, that some particularly um, needs related to, to, to measures in the pandemic, for example, um, deaf people's uh, access to information has been a real challenge. So I think it's really, I think one thing that comes out is really being able to, to, to not make generalizations, but to see individuals in their own context and, and their own particular challenges. I think the other thing that's really come out, and I think the pandemic has sort of taught us is, is the importance of connections that we are connected uh, to to each other and to to people in a, in a different way, perhaps more than we thought. 
Um, and I, I, I always think of John Donne's famous poem, No Man is an Island. And I think, you know, we, we often think we are completely independent, but, it, you know, something like this shows us how dependent we are on the supermarket workers, on the transport workers, on the refuse collectors uh, around us. And I think that's really been highlighted by the pandemic, the importance of um, connections. And of course, you know, no, no man is an island, but, but also no island is an island. And of course, in the UK, uh, we uh, as international uh, uh, attendees will be perhaps be aware, we've, we've recently sort of been thinking of ourselves as completely independent. But, you know, the, the pandemic has shown that we are actually all connected and, and a pandemic has affected the whole world. And, and you know, nobody's safe until everybody's safe. And, and you know, it's particularly in terms of vaccination rates, um, you know, we, we, we do need not just for the comment from the participant about global travel, but, you know, in terms of the world being safe, a safe place, we need to tackle the, the, the virus uh, on a global level. I think the other theme that really comes across is social support, the value of uh, family and friends. I mean, some of the participants did talk about um, sort of formal mental health services, and clearly that that it, it is important and has been, you know, under a demand. I should probably say that I think, particularly talking, you know, from my perspective, talking to other psychological societies uh, in the UK, we we were in. Uh, you know, we, we our access to mental health services, even though there are real challenges, particularly um, it's been mentioned here today about children and young people, the sort of rise in demand and, and meeting that and also access for, for, for older people and people with disabilities. But you know, in, in lots of ways, our access for, for universal access to mental health is, is far more than even many other developed countries. And a lot of our, my colleagues in other psychological associations were setting up helplines and trying to, to make focus just on access to services. But at least we have a, a, a sort of infrastructure around that. But um, support, I mean, thing that's, that comes across is that so, sort of facilitating support from friends and family and colleagues. It's something we've focused a lot in terms of NHS staff support, just trying to put things in place to, to uh, facilitate people supporting each other because that that is our sort of first line of um, support and that I think has been you know we, we've realized in a lot of the comments um, reflect that uh, the, the challenges from from being sort of cut off and distanced from uh, social support even uh, uh, many of you've been watching the Olympics it's a uh, surprise me how many of the Olympic athletes who are these are people who you think well you know they, they train and they, they they should be on a different level to all of us but they say well not having my family in the audience really has a big effect on me and you think well if that affects them well you know it, it, how much more it might affect other people so I think uh, trying to facilitate um, social support uh, and also to manage um, um, anti-social behaviour, bullying uh, has certainly come out in lot, some of the research that Nigel uh, quoted as a, as a significant factor. So really being able to, to um, facilitate social support. Um, and I think, you know, drawing on these themes, a lot of people have talked about build back, building back better. Um, and actually that, that term predates the pandemic. Um, it actually was used for, um, sort of officially in the first time um, in 2015 with the disaster reduction uh, plan developed by the UN, and it was put forward by the Japanese who were hosting that uh, conference and they've got a lot of experience of disasters they uh, are prone to, to earthquakes and it just a few years previously had the Fukushima um, nuclear power disaster triggered by an earthquake and a tsunami um, and they talk a lot about trying to build back and build resilience in and I think you know we're in this position now where you know we, we, we're sort of emerging from the pandemic we're still certainly not out of it yet but I think what you know one of the things we definitely need to be doing and, and just echoing previous speakers is thinking about these things that we've paid more attention to and have, have come to the fore during this time and really making sure that we use those as the foundations for, for building uh, resilience to, to the future to, for, for pandemics, but also to, to other sort of more everyday sources of um, challenges and stresses. Um, so really, I think drawing on those themes in terms of, of building back, so trying to, to um, facilitate a community, um, learn learn from others, learn from other countries. We've mentioned a, a few times that, uh, you know, it's part of the challenge has been not, not learning so much from, from others and fostering this collaboration, which has been, I think, one of the real strong points um, and, and developing social support, trying to put, put things in place to facilitate social support and um, manage 
um, the, the challenges of lack of social support or, or um, antisocial behaviour uh, in across in communities, but also in schools. Um, so I'll leave it there because I've said I wouldn't talk much for that, but we haven't talked as much as anybody else. Uh, but I'm sure the audience has got plenty to say. Lovely. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for the presentation, uh, all presenters. Um, so as we are moving into the next uh, the next uh, session, um, we have part of the webinar series, a social media challenge, inviting the public to submit a photo video uh, of what good habits will you continue to do post pandemic. So to do to fit with today's topic, we are happy to announce that Patrick is the winner um, with um, a quote uh, uh, I started learning Spanish in July 2019. During the pandemic, I stepped up my learning by starting to have video calls with Spanish people two or three times a week. It has been amazing to learn more about the language, meet new people, and has opened up a world of literature, films, etc. I'm definitely going to keep it up as it's been exceptionally rewarding. Thank you, Kylie, for sharing. So Patrick is our winner. Uh, so I'd like now to take uh, uh, to take you into a discussion and we have some questions uh, from the audience. The first one is for Deborah. Uh, what is the role of technology for older people? Can this be a source of support for them to reduce feelings of loneliness? Um, yes, well, funny enough, we've been using and trialing a range of different technologies through the pandemic from things as simple as Alexa um, to support people to use that in their own homes to be able to, you know, to, to have conversations to, to, in terms of to be able to connect with people by the phone if they don't have kind of um, not very confident on the use of mobiles or other platforms we've also been doing a lot um, of testing out of things like um, facebook portals and others again to allow connection um, and that for a lot of people has been absolutely life-changing actually and i think one of the really interesting things about the pandemic is how many more people uh, of older people have become connected and uh, digitally connected however there are still an awful lot of people who aren't um, but I do think technology has a really important part to play for people, both in terms of that connection, and that's, for example, online shopping that many of us have had to do during the pandemic. Actually, it's been a really important source. I think what what it's I did a, a really interesting um, session a little while ago with a group of financial services companies, and there were a lot of older people that took part in it who were very proudly saying, "Look, look, look I'm on Zoom, and I used all the time, and I joined things in other parts of the world," and then we got into but I won't pay my bills online and I won't use financial services online and I'm not going to do my money online. And so I think we just have to be clear about what the limitations are and how we build people's confidence. I'd also say I think there are also other really important uses of technology for older people, both in terms of, of life aids as well. So supporting people's mobility and independence within the home. Um, you know, I, I know that there are trials as well of, of robots in care homes, not sure how I feel about those, to be fair. Um, but I think that, you know, this is obviously an area that we need to look at moving forward. So thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you. My, our next question is for Nigel. Uh, as someone who is not in policy or part of the BPS, what are some things that we can do now to help support your cause? That's interesting. Well, you can contact me. Um, <laughs> So um, that, that, that would be helpful. I mean, some of the work that I've spoken about is still ongoing. So um, we have got the, the tail end of our From Poverty to Flourishing campaign, uh, which is drawing to a close this year. And we are encouraging members to support um, uh, ideas and proposals for uh, next year's Senate campaign. Um, but um, in terms of work with children and young people and their mental health, that, that's ongoing. Uh, so if uh, you know, uh, attendees of uh, this event ha ha have ideas that they'd like to share with me, then I'd be very happy to receive them. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for David. I think the audience has been very kind, giving one question to each. <laughs> 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 so um, as a clinical psychologist, David, what are some techniques that you have found helpful in coping with the anxiety, stress that many are feeling? So it's kind of a broad question, isn't it? Um, 
I I think um, well I guess um, I guess there's there's two there's two sort of aspects to to experience of stress isn't there there's the the sort of threat part of it um, and then there's the sort of resources to cope part and then we often think about stress as a balance between those two um, and I think in terms of the the threat um, then you know often we we think about trying to get control or get or at least find information about a threat so um you know depending on on um the nature of it and i guess you know what just picking up a, an example for random which which um you know the, the the question hasn't given me a specific example so i'll i'll, I'll take one you know but there are lots of people who are worried uh, about you know still worried about the um you know, coming out of lockdown and still still um, threats people who are particularly um, you know, vulnerable from the, from their health um, uh, point of view, or or you know, still to be vaccinated, for for example. And I think you know, for, for those people, you know, using public transport, going into public places can be very anxiety provoking. And um, you know, it, it it's um, you know, there are things that obviously people can do, pl planning their routes and you know, to to try and. Uh, ensure that they, um, you know, don't don't get themselves in a, in a difficult situation of being in a, in a crowded place that that um, you know would would make them feel particularly anxious. Um, you know, so I think sort of planning ahead, um, you know, f understanding the the risks, um, you know, get, getting more information. I think sometimes um, you know be, be, some of the sort of uncertainties can, can be helpful I mean there's a the information can be a double-edged sword and that's one of the things certainly that came out of the long COVID and actually we put into the rehab program about you know a certain amount of information well uh, information itself can be unhelpful but but if you start going online and if you yeah, I've spent a lot of time over the last year in sort of Facebook groups for people with long COVID symptoms and then you what you find is of course you get the more catastrophic interpretations in that it, you know people with catastrophic things happening to them tend to post more about it than people who you know who have recovered naturally over the six months so you just need to be aware of where the information is coming from and how um you know that sort of uh, ensure that it's representative um so getting information i think and and you know um if that can be a really helpful thing in terms of um resources to cope with it i guess it comes back to um social support that we've talked about um can be really helpful but also you know the, the basic sort of things to manage um anxiety symptoms um you know mindfulness relaxation um distraction um can, can all be can all be really helpful things writing i mean just journaling we we know that that can be a helpful um have a helpful effect on um emotional well-being so and and of course the other thing to say about sort of techniques is that nothing works um you know there's a sort of uh, match between the individual and a particular technique so you know you're bound to find someone who's who's a, a sort of you know mindfulness sort of um uh sort of um uh, aficionado who says you know, but but i've known plenty of people who who find mindfulness just drives them crazy so other you know other things to other people so i think finding what's what works for you is, is a good way forward hopefully I I think that's a lovely answer. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, another question is, how can we cope uh, with digital divide and its impact on online education, especially in developing countries like India? I don't know who would like to take that question from the panel. Who has the energy? I can, I can attempt it. Thank you, uh, Nigel. Thank you. By reflecting on, I suppose, what's happened here in in England specifically, you know, there was, you know, when school children had to be taught at home and weren't allowed to go to school, um, the Department for Education eventually, you know, procured huge amounts of um, technology and tablets and and um, iPads and, and laptops and things like that. But what it did expose uh, was, you know, a huge divide between those that have and those that do not have. Um, and, you know, we had examples of, you know, a family of, you know, five or six people sharing one smartphone. Um, and of course, that was also limited by the amount of data that they were able to buy. Um, so, you know, it really did expose, you know, sort of the stark differences within the United Kingdom between, you know, it was found that, you know, children that lived in areas 
of disadvantage, you know, spent less time on online um, simply because they couldn't afford the, 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 the data. And then people from areas of affluence, um, you know, had support from their parents, you know, each parent would have it would have a, a machine or a device and all of the children would have one as, as well. I mean, how, uh, I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to answer the question to you, the question of satisfaction about how do you deal with, with that in, in a place like India with you know, a huge population. Um, but it would be about the Indian government perhaps thinking about the resources and, and, and uh, how it prioritises those to ensure that you know, where people do have to you know, um, not, you know, work from home or undertake education from home, how they actually support the people to do that. Thank I you very much. If I could just skip to yes, definitely. come in. Um, I, I think, I mean, you, I absolutely agree with everything that, that Nigel said. I think, uh, we, you know, it's, it's so easy. Typically, the, the people making um, decisions um, and poli policy people in policy and, and professionals uh, you know, have have high levels of, of sort of computer literacy and access to to IT. So you know, it's it's really easy to overestimate the um, the the uh, you know the the rollout of that and how how accessible that is. Um, and so, absolutely agree with everything Nigel said. I think, however, there's also another part of it that the digital divide. You know, there can actually be a digital connection. And and I mentioned the NHS um, rehab package that we. Um, developed and I'll just put the link to it in the, the there's a sort of a, a, glow, a sort of open access part which is a website and then a um, an, an app based program that has to be supervised by a health professional but we did this uh, open access website and I'm just um, and of course we were just thinking about the UK when we were developing it um, but just looking at the I've just pulled up the figures for July um, and so to, to date there's been um, uh, one, th one million eight hundred users of that site, and uh, of those, only sixty-one percent are actually from the UK, and those from India are eleven percent of all users of that NHS site are from India. So, you know, did, did technology does give us this this um, amazing ability, as a, as is illustrated by the, the study, uh, to actually reach across boundaries, and you know, in, thinking about us developing something that might be useful to people in India. Um, you know, is something I guess we wouldn't have thought of, uh, you know, even just a few years ago. So I think there are incredible um, opportunities um, to, to and, and again, the pandemic really illustrated that. Um, but, you know, we, we clearly do have to bear in mind um, the, the, the sort of constraints that, that go around that. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sorry, oh, Deborah. Okay. Oh, okay. don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose I just wanted to pick up on that on a slightly related point. So not particularly on the, just on the, the, the digital divide, but just I'm really mindful. We are so blessed in the UK to have been a first world country. And whilst there is a huge range of inequalities and disadvantage, it's a different scale in so many countries around the world. So, you know, my husband's family, my husband is Cuban and uh, Cuba is having a one heck of a time with the pandemic right now. And they lack basics from food to antibiotics, to devices, to any kind of connectivity. With all of the unrest in Cuba, what they do in terms of connectivity is turn it off so that nobody can get that. And I just kind of was wanted to flag that because I think it's very easy for us to talk about these things in our first world the scenarios, but actually, you know, the, ex the experience for my family right now in Cuba is really stark. People are dying all the time without the, any basics whatsoever. And the levels of poverty and hunger, you know, my father-in-law died yesterday, not of COVID, but actually from the lack of basic treatments to deal with, to stabilize his diabetes and other things and miss and, and lack of diagnosis and he couldn't get near a hospital they are completely overrun and I just think you know this is this is something we need to be really mindful of and as as David very eloquently you know said you know no one is an island and no island is an island and actually until you know we sort this out for the whole of the world population and ensure everybody is vaccinated and safe none of us are and so we need to have a real focus on that and I certainly would like to see the UK taking a much greater leadership role in addressing that. Thank you, Deborah, and I'm sorry to hear of uh, your loss as well. Um, uh, good wishes to your family. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah. Uh, Aztec, did you want to say something? Problem or the concerns which they raise or they 
show some examples are so much uh, even though we look positive in in pandemic situation that uh, uh, in some manner it is very hopeful that we we get to access so much things but still uh, there are lots of problems especially in uh, in developing or underdeveloped countries where we have uh, we are only catering to very few and we are we are very much uh, unable to uh, access all such resources which are available to uh, big countries uh, and uh, we are very much impacted with, uh, with the uh, with uh, loss of resources and we are uh, struggling but yeah we are hoping that uh, it will soon get better uh, and uh, we just uh, hope that yeah vaccination will might solve the problem and online and offline both at least blended medium should be uh, reinstalled thank you Thank you very much, Astik. Thank you for sharing. And we are recording it, so you will have access to the recording and listen to the responses a bit more uh, carefully. Um, uh, Jimin, do, would you like to unmute and ask, or do you want me to uh, to go for the question? So I hope you don't mind. I'm not going to um, show my video. I felt very called out by the pajamas comment earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but in, in my defense, it's uh, one thirty on our side. Um, so yeah, I just well, first off, thank you all very much for the uh, all the sharing. I think there's a lot of insights here that we, I think, all of us in the audience will take away from this. But I'm just sort of wondering with this issue of mental health access, you know, not just from the pandemic, but on a larger scale, because we've had a lot of talk about. Um, improving access and how important this is, which I completely agree with. But I wonder if that's coming at the expense of uh, sort of more tangible or more concrete systemic issues, such as I pointed out, you know, things like job insecurities, people losing jobs, um, having to work much longer hours, you know, even for students where they're being forced to do this sort of catching up as though we've lost all this time, which are very I think prominent stresses. And I think even in, if I call it correctly, the studies um, that the second highest, the, uh, second largest percentage was on getting funding and financial worries. So I'm just sort of thinking, oh, you know, would like to hear what you think about, is there a risk that we sweep all this under the issue of mental health access and therefore not address um, them in their own right? Yeah. Um, let me know if this, uh, sorry, that was a very long question, but please let me know if I could be clear about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Timin. Um, would, would anyone like to give it a go to respond? I think this will be our last question uh, for the webinar. We, we know that there's been a huge increase in, in mental health difficulties across the entire population. Some of that might ebb away once the you know, the, the, the vaccination has been rolled out more fully and you know, the number of cases and infections and deaths have, have, have come down. You know, I've heard from school teachers that once the children had returned to school, there was a bit of a bounce back in terms of their sense of well-being. I'm not entirely sure that was the case for teenagers, but certainly for, for younger children. Um, but this, we're, we're going, going to be in this for the long haul. I mean, sometimes, you know, with people suffering from PTSD, for instance, might not experience symptoms for six or seven years later after the event. Um, what we desperately need is actually a workforce plan um, for the for the health sector. Um, there isn't one. Um, you know, there, there's been a sort of resistance to that. And um, but uh, I think for us as an organisation, you know, we we would des desperately want to see a workforce plan in place, and then there's got to be monitoring. And you know, you know, and keeping an eye on, on those data sets and uh, seeing what's happening. But uh, we're, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. Yet yeah, we're not we're not over this by a long way. Um, and um, but yeah, so definitely from that, from my perspective, workforce strategy and you know learning from the pandemic. I mean, for example, in Vietnam, that's a population of ninety million people. Where here in the UK, it's about sixty-seven million. They've had less than 600 deaths from COVID, and yet we've had in excess of 165,000 deaths. And so what have they been doing there that we could learn from uh, for any future pandemic that might arise? I think there's the number of issues there that, you know, if we had time, we could debate it more fully. 
Thank you very much, Nigel. And I think that uh, the, there's no time, we're over time now. So uh, we appreciate uh, everyone's support with the webinars. Thank you very, very much to Kerry and David and Nigel and uh, Deborah. We appreciate the time you gave uh, to us. Thank you to everyone. And I hope everybody has a lovely evening. Do please stay in touch uh, with us.